So here we are in Slavati, whose afternoon meditation was peaceful. <laughs> Everybody, that's very interesting. So in thinking about what to read and want to comment about Slavati, there's really a lot because uh, Lord Buddha spent so much time here. And because he spent so much time here also, then you have these, these other people who had a very important role to play in supporting the Sangha in the area. So you have the foremost lay man supporter, Anatta Pindika. Then you also have the foremost lay woman supporter, Visaka. <coughs> and then you have so many teachings that were given here. So I'm just going to give a, a few readings to introduce Anatta Pindika, uh, and then also Visaka. And then also uh, one of the teachings that was given here, set the context. But it, it is really nice, isn't it, to just to go in and feel the place, meditate, and, and then... Because we've all heard a lot of these stories before we go anyway, so I think it's really important, rather than fill the mind with more thoughts, that we go in there and we just empty the mind of thoughts and uh, feel the power of these holy places that because of all of the spiritual energy accumulated there and probably because of the devas also rejoicing and people coming and those devas spreading metta to us, then uh, we often find the mind becomes very peaceful. And then you have this noise, as I was talking about before, this constant noise right now. We've got a beautiful puja just <laughs> starting in the background. And when that puja's over, we'll probably have all of them going back to their rooms, slamming their doors and yelling in the hallway. It's just always noise in India such a populated place so but we notice that clarity that's in the same space as the noise and we can find that clarity in these very special places so I've asked you this in most of these holy places whose minds became peaceful and on most occasions most of you put your hands up so they really are they really are special and it's you know it's really wonderful to come and experience that because it and uh, one thing I was always saying last night was towards the end of that long bus ride from uh, Lumbini here to Samati everyone's probably feeling like oh 16 days is too long oh four more days to go but uh, Ajahn Oh said in her experience you'll be back for seven days at most before you have the thought I want to go back to India <laughs> because it's these moments of peace and clarity and what the Buddha would call a rapture and tranquility, which are uh, factors of enlightenment, two of the seven factors of enlightenment that you touch, it's not a really, it's not a coarse experience that, that fills your mind with a really obvious perception. But what's happening is, is the mind is relaxing and feeling well on a very deep level. And uh, that's what they call tranquility. It's sublime. It's, and it's when you leave that you realize, ah, oh, it was really nice. It's an experience of an absence of suffering, and it's an experience of an absence of impingement. And so much of our life is full of impingements, and so much of our life is, you know, there's suffering as well to wrestle with. And so we, we have these spacious moments and this heightened clarity, and just uh, some we're talking about asking people how their experience was in Lumbini, and people used the word empty. The mind was empty, serene, still. And, it, and then I asked, but did you also notice a feeling of being nourished as well? And then everyone's, yes, also there's a feeling of being nourished. In allowing the mind to become still, something in these holy places is also nourishing the mind. So this, this very subtle and sublime, it is a pleasure. The Buddha says that peacefulness is the highest happiness. So we don't even realize it when we're experiencing, because like, as I'm saying, it's kind of an absence of other phenomena. But when you go back to your life and your usual concerns come crashing in, you will have that feeling of, oh, Lumbini was nice, oh, Vulture's Peak was nice, oh, the Jetavana was lovely. <laughs> and you'll, you'll forget the eight hours, forget the eight hour bus ride. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Part of the reason I say this is that tomorrow we have a ten hour bus ride. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a preemptive strike. <laughs> and you have a, but now that you're all gang, as I've been saying, now that you're all well practiced and we've been pumping up our determination and our patience, we're, we're well primed for doing that. And then Sarnath is another very special place. And that's the last on our list of, of holy places. 
as well as Varanasi, the city itself, which is a holy place for Hindus. But one one uh, tour guide, actually, a couple of pilgrimages ago, had mentioned that in the Jataka tales, which is where the Buddha's past lives as a bodhisattva, they talk about Varanasi as being this ageless, timeless, ancient city. And there's a fire at the Shiva burning gap, which I'm going to take, those of you who are willing to go, I'm going to take you there. And they say that that flame has not gone out for 4,000 years. So it's, it is a very old city. And then many of the Jataka tales begin with the Buddha was such and such in Banaras. So he, it is for Buddhists also a holy site because it's where the Bodhisattva was building the requisite qualities to become the Buddha. It's also uh, sacred to us in that regard. So um, it's, it's nice that we're going there. Nice that we'll, if we all make it, hopefully we make it. We're on the final stretch now. Three out of the four primary holy sites already visited and many of the secondary ones, Veluvana, Jetavana, Vulture's Peak, Dungasiri, the Austerities Cave, so and Kapilavastu and Vaisali. So I've never been to those two places and I'm very glad that we did go. <coughs> I was thinking myself, just to break up the drive yesterday and just to remember the, the context, to pop into Kapilavastu that that would be nice. I wasn't expecting t- that it would feel so peaceful. And I think we all felt that, didn't we? We all felt this sense of uplift. And this beautiful park now as well, and a lovely sense of space and clarity and uplift. So, uh, yeah, these places are special. If the Bodhisattva spent 29 years there, it's possible that there's a lot of good energy there. Anyway, back to Sawati and introducing Anattapindika. The first reigns after his enlightenment was spent by the Buddha at Banaras. So that would have been at Sarnath, in the Sarnath area. The second and third were spent at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the Velavana. It is after the third reigns that Anattapindika, the feeder of the poor, makes his appearance. The occasion was this. The Buddha, the Blessed One, was living at that time in Rajagaha, in the bamboo grove, and there had been no pronouncement made by him about dwellings for bhikkhus, so they were living under trees. They were living here and there in the woods, at the roots of trees, under overhanging rocks, in ravines, in hillside caves, in charnel grounds, in jungle thickets, in the open, on heaps of straw. As they left such places in the early morning, they inspired confidence, whether in moving forwards or returning, looking ahead or aside, bending or stretching, their eyes were downcast and they moved with grace. During that time, a rich merchant of Rajagaha visited the park, He saw them as they went about thus, and in his heart he trusted them. He approached them and asked, Lords, if I had dwellings built, would you live in them? The Blessed One has not allowed dwellings. Then Lords, ask the Blessed One and tell me what he says. They told this to the Blessed One. He gave his permission, and when he had done so, they told the merchant. In a single day he had sixty dwellings built. Then he invited the Blessed One and the Sangha for the following day's meal. At the end of the meal, he formally presented the dwellings to the Sangha. The merchant's sister was the wife of Anattapindika, who chose at the time to come to Rajagaha on some business or other. At that very time, in fact, when the Sangha of Bhikkhus headed by the Buddha had been invited by the merchant for the following day. The merchant was directing his servants and retainers, now get up early, cook gruel and rice and sauces, make desserts, sweets. Anattapindika thought... Formerly when I came, this householder used to lay aside all his engagements to welcome me. Now he seems distracted with ordering his servants about. Is there a taking in marriage or a giving in marriage? Is there some great sacrifice? Or has he invited Senia Bimbisara, king of Magadha, for tomorrow with a full retinue? When the merchant had finished directing his servants, he went to Anattapindika and welcomed him. Then when he had sat down beside him, Anattapindika told him his thoughts, and he replied, There is no marriage, nor has the king been invited for tomorrow with a full retinue, but I have a great sacrifice. I have invited for tomorrow the Sangha of Bhikkhus, headed by the Buddha, the Enlightened One. Do you say the Buddha? I say the Buddha. Do you say the Buddha? I say the Buddha. Do you say Buddha? I say Buddha. This news, the Buddha, the Buddha, is hard to come by in the world. Is it possible to go and see this Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, now, at this time? This is not the right time to go and see Him. You can see Him early tomorrow. 
Then in Atapindika thought, early tomorrow I shall be able to see a blessed one, accomplished and fully enlightened. He lay down thinking of the Buddha. Three times in the night he got up, fancying it was dawn. Then when he went to the Siwaka gate, non-human beings opened the gate. As soon as he was out of the city, light left him and darkness was before him. Fear, awe and horror arose in him. He wanted to turn back, but the invisible spirit Siwaka made himself heard. A hundred elephants, a hundred horses, a hundred chariots drawn by she-mules, a hundred thousand maidens decked with gems and earrings, all these are not even worth a sixteenth part of one step forward now. Go forward, householder, go forward. Better go forward than turn back. When the spirit had said this for the third time, darkness left him and light was before him. The fear, awe and horror subsided in him, then he went to the cool grove where the Buddha was. Now on that occasion the Blessed One had risen early towards dawn and was pacing up and down in the open. He saw Anattapindika coming, and when he saw him, he left his walk and sat down on a seat made ready for him. When he had done so, he said to Anattapindika, Come, Sudatta. Anattapindika thought, He addresses me by name. And he was happy and hopeful. He went to the Blessed One and prostrated himself at his feet and he said, I trust that the Blessed One has slept well. The Buddha utters a verse, A Brahman true sleeps ever well. Who has attained to full Nibbāna, whom sense desires leave intact, cooled, without substance of existence, he has rejected all attachments. There is no conflict in his heart. He sleeps in bliss who is at peace, the peace established in the mind. Then the Blessed One gave Anattapindika progressive instruction. While Anattapindika sat there, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in him. All that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. Then he became independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. He said, Magnificent Lord, beginning from today, let the Blessed One receive me as his follower who has gone to him for refuge for as long as breath lasts. Lord, let the Blessed One with the Sangha of Bhikkhus accept tomorrow's meal from me. Then the Blessed One accepted in silence. Then knowing that the Blessed One had accepted, he rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, he departed, keeping him on his right. The rich merchant of Rajika heard, it seems that the Sangha of Bhikkhus headed by the Buddha has been invited by Anattapindika. He said to Anattapindika, The Sangha of Bhikkhus headed by the Buddha has been invited by you for tomorrow, but you are a guest. I will give you the money to provide the food for the Sangha of Bhikkhus headed by the Buddha. There is no need, I have money to provide food for the Sangha of Bhikkhus headed by the Buddha. A citizen of Rajagaha heard of it and he offered to provide the money, but Anattapindika refused. And Senia Bimbisara, king of Magadha, offered likewise and was refused. Then when that night was over, Anattapindika had good food of various kinds prepared at the merchant's house. And he had the time announced to the Blessed One, It is time, Lord, the meal is ready. It now being morning, the Blessed One dressed, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went accompanied by the Sangha of Bhikkhus to the merchant's house, and he sat down on the seat made ready there. Then the householder, Anattapindika, served with his own hands the Sangha, headed by the Buddha, and satisfied them with different kinds of good food. When the Blessed One had eaten and no longer had the bowl in his hand, Anattapindika sat down at one side. He said to the Blessed One, Lord, let the Blessed One with the Sangha of Bhikkhus consent to dwell with me at Sawati for the rains. Perfect ones delight in rooms that are void, householder. I know, Blessed One, I know, Sublime One. Then when the Blessed One had instructed and urged and roused and encouraged Anattapindika with talk on the Dhamma, he rose from his seat and went away. At that time Anattapindika had many friends and acquaintances to welcome him. When he had finished his business in Rajagaha, he set out for Savati. On the way he directed people, sirs, make gardens, build dwellings, arrange gifts of food. A Buddha has appeared in the world, he has been invited by me, he will come by this road. Then those people did as he had directed them. When Anattapindika arrived at Savati, he looked all around the city for a suitable place, a suitable retreat, until he saw Prince Jeta's pleasure park, which had all the requisite qualities. He went to Prince Jeta and said, Sir, give me your park to use. The park is not to be given without the sum of a hundred thousand spread over it. The park is taken, sir. The park is not taken, householder. They asked arbitrating officers whether it was taken or not, and the arbitrators said, 
As soon as you set a value on it, sir, it was taken. Then another Pinika had gold brought in carts, and he had Jeta's Grove covered with a hundred thousand gold coins spread over it. The gold they brought at first was not enough to complete it, and there was a small space near the gate that was left uncovered. Anatta Pindika ordered people to go and fetch gold to cover the space. Then it occurred to Prince Jeta, this can be no ordinary matter, since Anatta Pindika is spending so much gold. He told Anatta Pindika, enough householder, do not cover that space, leave me that space, it shall be my gift. Anatta Pindika thought, this Prince Jeta is a prominent, well-known person. It will be very good if such well-known people acquire confidence in the Dhamma and discipline. So he left that space for Prince Jeta, who had a gatehouse built on it. Then Anatta Pindika had dwellings erected in Jeta's grove. He had open terraces laid out. He had gates made, waiting halls put up, fire rooms, storehouses and closets built, walks leveled, well rooms prepared, baths constructed, bathrooms arranged, ponds excavated and pavilions raised. When the Blessed One had stayed at Rajgaha, as long as he chose, he set out to wander by stages to Vesali. When he at length arrived, he went to the hall. So he's passing through Vesali, which is where we pass through also. So it's just nice to recollect that the Buddha walked with uh, large groups of, of monks and then later nuns as well, through these parts that we've been traveling. Wandering by stages, the Blessed One at length arrived at Savati. There he went to stay in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pinika's park. Then Anatta Pinika went to the Blessed One and invited him for the following day's meal. The Blessed One accepted in silence. When the meal was over and the Blessed One no longer had his bowl in his hand, Anatta Pinika sat down at one side and he asked, Lord, how shall I act about this Jeta's Grove? Then, householder, you may present it to the Sangha of Bhikkhus of the Four Quarters, past, future and present. Even so, Lord, he replied, and he did so. Then the Blessed One addressed him with these stanzas. It keeps out cold and heat, wild animals besides, and creeping things and flies, and chills and rain as well. And it affords protection when sun and wind are fierce. The aim is to be sheltered and at ease in order to concentrate and practice insight. Gifts of dwellings to the order are praised most highly by the Buddha. So let a man possessed of wisdom who sees wherein his own good lies have comfortable dwellings made, and have the learned live in them. He can give food to them and drink, and clothing and a resting place, letting his heart repose its trust in those who walk in righteousness. And they will teach the Dharma to him, for freedom from all suffering, knowing which Dharma he here attains Nibbana and is free from taints. So this is a very beautiful verse about the purpose of offering the Sainasana, the dwellings, how it supports the monks in practice, and then, most importantly, it establishes a relationship, doesn't it? So, in making offerings and in helping the monks, then the monks will, to the degree that they can, uh, make efforts to try to teach. This is a mutually beneficial, very beautiful, reciprocal relationship between uh, dayakas and summoners. So many people in this room have helped to offer requisites at the monastery where we live, and so here we are all now on pilgrimage, studying Dhamma together. The Buddha who was now staying at Savati, the capital of Kosala, had come from the country of Magadha, whose capital was Rajagaha. Magadha was one of the two most powerful states in central India at that time. It lay south of the Ganges with its northern border on the river. Its king was Bimbisara, who had already declared himself an adherent of the Buddha. Bimbisara's brother-in-law, King Pasenadi, governed the other great kingdom called Kosala, which stretched north from the north bank of the Ganges to the foothills of the Himalayas. King Pasenadi had, it seems, not as so far as met the Buddha. King Pasenadi became a steward, and he became a supporter of the Buddha, and he loved him very much. Visaka. Do you want to hear a little bit about Visaka? Ajahn Anan mentions Visaka often, and he says that she was king. Gang Mark. When she when she was making the food for the five hundred monks and she was in the kitchen and she she was you know, lifting the big pots and, and uh, he said she was very, very strong. Beautiful and strong as well. Sorry? Balanced. 
we all should aspire to be beautiful and strong. From the age of seven, she was a sotapanna. So I'm not sure how much I'll read, but I'll, I'll start. Uh, I should have done a little bit of preparation, exactly what to read, but after our two-hour meditation session in the Jetavana, I was sitting in this room thinking, I feel very peaceful. I didn't want to fill my head with thoughts, so I'm only just looking at these things now. So please bear with me. Do you notice that? After long sessions of meditation, there's just this nice, less thoughts. It's nice just to leave the mind without too many thoughts. But of all the things to think about, foremost disciples of the Buddha are very worthy. Visaka, the Buddha's chief patroness. In the city of Badia, in the country of Anga, there lived a rich man named Mendaka. In an earlier life, in a time of famine, he had given the last provisions belonging to him and his family to a Pacheka Buddha, a privately enlightened one. For this sacrifice, this self-conquest, he obtained supernatural merit in his present life. The provisions in his house were never exhausted, however much he consumed them or gave them away, and his fields carried a rich harvest without interruption. It was not Mendica alone who possessed supernatural merit. His wife, his son and daughter-in-law, and his slave had all shared in the same past deed of self-abnegation in that earlier life, and as a result, they had all acquired miraculous powers in their present life. Their shared participation in that noble deed had become a bond uniting them in successive existences as they transmigrated through the round of rebirths. The son, Dhananjaya, and his wife, Sumanadevi, had a young daughter named Visaka, who was also a repository of past merits. In a previous life, 100,000 eons earlier, she had formed the aspiration at the feet of the Buddha Padumutara to become the chief patroness of a Buddha and his Sangha. To fulfill this goal, she had performed virtuous deeds under many previous Buddhas, accumulating the spiritual perfections required of a great disciple. Now that merit had matured and was about to yield its fruit. One day when Misaka was seven years of age, the Buddha arrived in the city of Bhadiya, accompanied by a great retinue of monks. When Mendika heard that the Awakened One had come, he sent for his beloved granddaughter and said to her, Dear girl, this is a happy day for us, for the teacher has arrived in our own city. Summon all your maid servants and go out to meet him. Visaka did as she was told. She approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and stood to one side. The Buddha then taught the Dhamma to her and her entourage, and at the end of the discourse, Visaka and all her five hundred maid servants were established in the fruit of stream entry. Mendika too listened to the Dhamma, along with his wife, his son and daughter-in-law, and his slave, and all attained to stream entry. So why is it possible that they all attain to stream entry so quickly? Basically, they could have quite some time earlier, but they've made this vow to, to meet the Buddha and serve him in this way. And uh, I'd actually forgotten that. I didn't realize that her 500 maidservants also. That's really wonderful, isn't it? And uh, interestingly enough, about this area and about lay women practitioners, there's a nunnery for eight precept nuns behind the Jetavana now. So when you walk in that gate, you see that big gold locust yes, yes. at the top of a stupa? There's an eight precept uh, from Thailand, Kunme Bongkot, who's uh, believed to be an anagami. And she was apparently, according to Ajahn Blian, who read her past lives and told someone who told someone who told someone, <laughs> that, <laughs> that she was one of these lay women who came to listen to the Buddha's teachings and she had a certain amount of privilege. She could travel, but the village couldn't. And many people, as we've talked about, women in ancient India being property and somewhat housebound, she went back and taught many of those people and so establish them in, them in enlightenment. So she has this particular merit that, uh, that she has a large <coughs> following. So it's interesting to hear that, that this is the kind of thing that did occur in the Buddha's day. And that once you're a Sotapanna, there's still a certain number of lives left. So obviously this woman has come back. And uh, one story I heard about her is that uh, when she had the well dug for this monastery, this nunnery, she dug it much deeper than the other wells. And people were saying, you don't need to dig it that deep. And she says, it's okay, just do what I say. And the following year there was a drought, 
and the only well still working was the one that she dug the previous year, which uh, won her a certain amount of esteem with the locals. So these things still occur, and uh, once again, uh, it's possible to attain even as a maidservant or an ape preceptor, if the requisite qualities are ripe. At that time, the country of Anga belonged to the kingdom of Magadha, which was ruled by the devout king Bimbisara. When King Pasenadi of Kosala heard that five people of supernatural merit were living in the neighboring kingdom, he requested King Bimbisara, his friend and brother-in-law, to send one of these people to his own country, the state of Kosala so that his subjects would have the opportunity to witness a shining example of virtue. Thus Mendika's son, Dananjaya, along with his family, moved to the country of Kosala and built a beautiful city named Saketa near the capital, Savati. There Visapa grew up in the midst of this saintly family where the Blessed One was highly venerated and his monks were frequently invited to receive alms and to preach the Noble Dhamma. In Savati, the capital of Kosala, there lived a wealthy householder named Mikara, who had a son named Puna Wadana. When the son reached manhood, his parents urged him to marry, but Puna Wadana insisted that he would take as wife only a girl who possessed the five beauties, beauty of hair, beauty of flesh, beauty of teeth, beauty of skin, and beauty of youth. His parents employed a team of Brahmins to explore the entire country looking for a girl who could meet their son's <laughs> stringent requirements. The Brahmins traveled to all the great towns and cities, searching diligently, but they could not find a single maiden endowed with all five kinds of beauty. On their return journey, when they reached Saketa, they saw Visaka, who at that time was 15 or 16 years of age, and they were struck immediately by her beautiful features, which measured up to four of their young lord's expectations. The one feature they could not see was her teeth. To obtain a glimpse of this, they decided to engage her in conversation. When they spotted her, Visaka and her companions were on their way to the river to bathe. Just then a thunderstorm burst. The other girls ran away hastily to avoid getting wet, but Visaka continued to walk with great dignity and poise. The Brahmins approached her and asked why she did not run for shelter like the others, and she answered, just as it is unbecoming for a king to run from the rain like an ordinary man, so it is unbecoming for a young girl of good family to run from the rain. Very gracious. The feminists won't like this. Next sentence. But this is what she said. Besides, as an unmarried girl, I have to take care of myself as if tending merchandise offered for sale. <laughs> the Brahmins were so impressed by their conversation with the girl what I take from this was the equipoise and the great I'm not running in the rain, they're beautiful the Brahmins were so impressed by their conversation with this girl that they went to her father and asked for her hand in marriage for their lord's son Dananjaya agreed to the proposal and soon afterwards the householder Migra with his son Punawadana and his whole family went to fetch the bride when King Pasenadi of Kosala heard of it, he joined the group together with his entire court. You imagine you know, the merit that Wisaka comes, the king is coming to fetch the bride. This is, uh, this is special. All these people were entertained joyfully and lavishly in Saketa by the bride's father. Meanwhile, goldsmiths were manufacturing the jewelry for the bride. After three months, the jewelry was not yet completed, but the firewood was used up for cooking meals for so many guests. For two weeks, old houses were demolished and the wood used for cooking. The jewelry was still not complete. The people of Saketa then took clothes out of their wardrobes, soaked them with oil and used them to kindle the cooking fires. After another two weeks, the jewelry was complete and the whole splendid assembly began the return journey. Dananjaya gave to his daughter as dowry many hundreds of carts laden with silk, gold, silver and servant girls. He also gave her a herd of cattle so large that all the roads in the city were choked. When these cattle left the stables, the remaining cows also tore their ropes and joined the traveling herd. People from 14 villages belonging to Dananjaya wanted to follow Visaka to her new home. So much was she liked everywhere. Such abundant wealth and such a large retinue Visaka had obtained through acts of merit in many earlier lives since she had already served the Buddha Padumutra countless eons ago. Now, even Visaka had some suffering. So that's what's good about this story. It's for us to contemplate. With all of that merit, 
for a time. She was miserable in the uh, in the new home. On the day she arrived in Savati, the city of her husband, Visaka was showered with various presents sent from people of all ranks according to their status and ability. But so kind and generous was she that she distributed them among the donors themselves with a kind message and treated all the residents of the city as her own kinsfolk. By this noble gesture she endeared herself to all the people of the city on the very first day that she came to her husband's home. There is a Pali phrase, uh, I can tell you a little story about it. I once made some offerings to a very special monk in Thailand called Lumpur Opa on my birthday many years ago, and I collected some of the gifts given to me on my birthday and I gave them all to him. And he handed me a monk's bag which had a Pali phrase on it and smiled at me. And I didn't know what the phrase said and I later asked a monk who was a Pali expert what it said and the bag said, those who give gifts will be loved. There is an incident in her life which reveals her dutiful kindness even towards animals. Hearing that her well-bred mare had given birth to a foal in the middle of the night, immediately Visaka rushed to the stable with her female attendants bearing torches in their hands and attended to all the mare's needs with the greatest care and attention. Her father-in-law Migara, being a staunch follower of an order of naked ascetics, never invited the Buddha to his house for alms, even though the master frequently dwelt at a nearby monastery. Shortly after the wedding, to obtain merit, he invited a large company of naked ascetics for arms, whom he treated with deep respect and presented with fine foods. On their arrival, he told his new daughter-in-law, Come, dear, and render homage to the Arahants. Visaka was delighted to hear the word Arahants and hurried to the hall, expecting to see Buddhist monks. But she saw only naked ascetics, devoid of all modesty, a sight that was unbearable for such a refined lady. She reproached her father-in-law and retired to her quarters without entertaining them. The naked ascetics took offence and reproached the millionaire for having brought a female follower of the ascetic Gautama to his house. They asked him to expel her from the house immediately, but Migara, with much effort, managed to pacify them. One day, while Migara was eating rich rice porridge mixed with honey in a golden bowl, a Buddhist monk came to the house in quest for arms. Visaka was fanning her father-in-law. She stepped to the side so that Migara could see the monk and give him his arms. But though the monk was in full view, Migara pretended not to notice him and continued with his meal. So Visaka told the monk, Pass on, venerable sir, my father-in-law is eating stale food. Migara was furious at this remark and wanted to throw his daughter-in-law out of the house, but the servants, who had been brought to the house by Visaka herself, refused to carry out his orders. The eight advisers to whom Migara's complaint against Visaka was put concluded on examination of the matter that Visaka was blameless. After this incident, Visaka informed her husband's family that she would be returning to her parents. Migara asked her forgiveness and Visaka consented to stay on the condition that she would be permitted to invite the Buddha and the order of monks to the house. Reluctantly, he gave his consent. So the meaning of that statement that my father is eating stale food was that according to Visaka's perspective he was eating the results of past merit but not making any more merit so it was old he was eating old and that's what the advisors discussed the matter and it was true what Visaka said was true (laughs) following the advice of the naked ascetics Migara Visaka's father-in-law did not serve the monks personally Just to be polite, he appeared shortly after the meal and then concealed himself behind a curtain while listening to the Buddha's sermon. However, the Buddha's words moved him so deeply that while sitting there hidden from view, he penetrated the ultimate truths about the nature of existence and attained to stream entry. So, isn't that interesting? But to have Visaka as your daughter-in-law, you must have a store of a lot of merit. So, once again, a thin veil of... uh, Delusion on top of a mountain of merit, very quick to throw off the delusion and very fast to see the truth. He then went up to the Blessed One, prostrated at his feet and declared his allegiance to the Triple Gem. Visaka invited the Buddha for the next day's meal and on that occasion her mother-in-law too attained stream entry. From that time on the entire family became staunch supporters of the Enlightened One and his community of monks and nuns. In course of time, Visaka gave birth to no fewer than ten sons and ten daughters. 
and all of them had the same number of descendants down to the fourth generation. In India, that is wealth. Ten sons, ten daughters. Visaka herself lived to the remarkably high age of 120, but according to the commentaries, all her life she retained the appearance of a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> this was the result of all of her merit and her enjoyment of the Dhamma, which filled her completely throughout the day. It is also said that she was as strong as an elephant and could work untiringly looking after her large family. She found time to feed the monks every day, to visit the monasteries, and to ensure that none of the monks and nuns lacked food, clothing, shelter, bedding, and medicines. Above all, she still found time to listen to the teaching of the Blessed One again and again. Therefore, the Blessed One said about her, Visaka stands foremost among my lay women supporters who serve as supporters of the order. One illustration of this is specifically mentioned in the Vinaya. One day Visaka had left her valuable bridal jewelry in the hall after listening to the Dhamma, and it was taken into custody by Ananda. So this became the cause of one of the rules for the monks about monasteries, as if someone forgets their wealth in the monastery, you're allowed to touch it, whether it's gold or money, for the sake of storing it to give back to that person. So Ananda took it into his custody. She interpreted this lapse as an invitation to do good and decided not to wear this jewelry again but to sell it and give alms to the order from the money obtained. But in the whole city of Savati there was no one who could buy this very precious jewellery, so she bought it herself out of her other property. And with the proceeds of the sale she built a large monastic establishment in the eastern park, Pubarama, which is about one kilometre that way. Before the city gate of Savati it was called the mansion of Mikara's mother. Why is it called the mansion of Mikara's mother? Visaka is the daughter-in-law, so how could she be Mikara's mother? Oh, she's, she led her to invite her daughter. That's right, because she insisted that he invite the Buddha and the Sangha to the house and then he attained to Dhamma, that he said, okay, from this day you are my mum. I will venerate you as my mother, my mother in Dhamma. Isn't that beautiful? She built a large monastic establishment in the eastern park called the Pubarama, before the city gate, it was called the mansion of Mikra's mother. It is often mentioned in the introduction to many Buddhist suttas, for the Blessed One frequently stayed there during the last 20 years of his life, just as he did in the Jetavana monastery built by his other great patron, Anathapinika. There's also the story of the special offerings that she asked, she requested to be able to offer to the Sangha, bathing cloths, for the rains retreat so that the monks wouldn't bathe naked in public, arms, food for Sikh monks and their attendants, food for monks and nuns traveling to and from. I won't go into all of the details of that, but basically, as the Buddha already said, she was foremost in her diligent service and in her generosity and in her kindness. She attained a Sotapanna from the age of seven, as well as her 500 maidservants. She also led her mother-in-law and father-in-law to uh, a level of enlightenment. So it did say that she served many Buddhas in order to have the honor of being the foremost attendant female lay sponsor of a Buddha. So you can see many Buddhas. That's going to take a long time, isn't it? And this path of Bharami, like if someone has a specific goal, then it's like she would be serving in a lesser capacity and then the next Buddha would be in a greater capacity and then in the next Buddha until she got the status and the requisite merit to be able to serve as the foremost. But uh, I really love her story for several reasons. Part of it is obviously the power of dana. So any of these ten bharamis that anyone cultivates with absolute sincerity, they're going in this direction. If you have the intention, and then I've talked about this several times, that when we make merit, we have to have the intention to attain the deathless. So, Visaka was developing her dana bharami so that she could attain enlightenment under a Buddha and also be his foremost laywoman disciple. It's not a very austere enlightenment, is it? She's born in the lap of luxury, she's extremely wealthy, but she's not attached to her wealth. So this is 
generosity is one of the paramis, renunciation is the other. So it's like being generous is one thing, but then being generous to the point where you're relinquishing. So on her, that's renunciation. It's like being generous of a percentage of what one has. That's dana. When you really give a lot, it's dana upabharami. And eventually, as people train in developing these bharami, they'll even give their life. But these two overcross renunciation. But renunciation, I think, is giving up things that one really likes. But you see her, the wedding gifts, she gave them all away on the very day. When she forgot her jewelry, which was <coughs> priceless, this is the jewelry that took months to produce the wedding, that she, she took that as an omen, oh, I don't need it, I'm supposed to sell it so that I can build a monastery, which she did do, and uh, it's just extraordinary. But what one can see is the, obviously the power of sila, and the power of dana, and the power of metta, and the power of faith. So it's a different kind of approach that led her to stream entry. And uh, so obviously other peoples have more renunciation in their uh, approach to enlightenment, depending on people's character traits. Now, and I would assume that her 500 maidservants had been building with her over those lives as well, so that they also had this requisite merit. And it's, it's said that in her household everyone loved her, she took care of everybody, so... This is also one of the results of dana, isn't it? You give a lot, the result is that you yourself don't lack. And uh, if you train yourself to enjoy giving, you become a cheerful person. You're giving a lot and you enjoy giving, then, then you're a cheerful person. And if you train your following, someone like Wisaka, she had a large following, she trains them also, and they're all giving together. They also teach this in Thailand, if you want to have a lot of generous friends in your future lives, when you make offerings, do it as a group, because what it's doing is making karmic connections with lots of people, so that in your next lives you'll be meeting up with the people that you made good karma with, and then you end up with this, uh, we call entire Boriwan, uh, a following of people that you've cultivated virtue with, and you have these auspicious karmic connections, and then, and it might be the case that you want to offer something, but you don't quite have enough money, but this, this, and this friend join in, and, and you're able to offer the things that you want to. So it's good to give, and it's good to give as groups. I just wanted to read a little bit now from one of the suttas taught in the monastery that, that Wisaka built, just a couple of hundred meters away. I think that approach of dana and metta and faith is probably not a fast one. There's these different approaches to realizing dhamma. One is the slow and pleasant, but it takes a long time. <laughs> and there's the hard and fast. And some people, depending on difficult and difficult and fast, but unfortunately, depending on character types, for some people, enlightenment is difficult and slow. <laughs> we all hope that will be the. Uh, and there's a fast and pleasant as well approach, but this is, depends on how much obstructive karma we've made, what our inner tendencies are, if we're stubborn, and these kind of things. So everyone wants to be on the, the fast and comfortable track. Let's be optimistic. <laughs> we all be on the fast and comfortable. For whom has it been fast and comfortable so far? <laughs> anyway, <let's laughs> anyway, after all of this merit from pilgrimage, let's be optimistic. This is very, this is very beautiful because this we've been talking mostly about Anattapindika and Wisaka and in their life stories, the Buddha and the Sangha are somewhat peripheral. But in this introduction to the Anapanasati Sutta, we get what it's all about, having built a monastery and offer it to the Buddha, what occurs there at that time. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Migara's mother, together with many well-known elder disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahamogalana, the Venerable Mahakasapa, the Venerable Mahakachana, the Venerable Mahakotita, the Venerable Mahakapina, the Venerable Mahachunda, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Revata, the Venerable Ananda, and other very well-known elder disciples. Now on that occasion, elder bhikkhus had been teaching and instructing new bhikkhus, some elder bhikkhus had been teaching and instructing ten bhikkhus, some elder bhikkhus had been teaching and instructing twenty, thirty, forty bhikkhus, and the new bhikkhus taught and instructed by the elder bhikkhus had achieved successive stages of high distinction. On that occasion, the apostate day of the 15th, on the full moon night of the Pawarana ceremony, 
The Blessed One was seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus, and then surveying the silent Sangha of Bhikkhus, he addressed them thus, Bhikkhus, I am content with this progress, my mind is content with this progress, so arouse still more energy to attain the unattained, to achieve the unachieved, to realize the unrealized. I shall wait here at Savati for the Komudi of the fourth month. The bhikkhus of the countryside heard the Blessed One will wait there at Savati for the Komudi full moon of the fourth month, and the bhikkhus of the countryside left in due course for Savati to see the Blessed One. And the elder bhikkhus still more intensively taught and instructed new bhikkhus, some elder bhikkhus taught and instructed ten, some elder bhikkhus taught and instructed twenty, thirty, and forty, and the new bhikkhus taught and instructed by the elder bhikkhus achieved successive stages of high distinction. On that occasion, the Apostle today of the 15th, the full moon night of the Komudi full moon of the fourth month, the Blessed One was seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus, then surveying the silent Sangha of Bhikkhus, he addressed them thus, Bhikkhus, this assembly is free from prattle. This assembly is free from chatter. It consists purely of heartwood. Such is this Sangha of Bhikkhus, such is this assembly. Such an assembly is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, an incomparable field of merit for the world, such is this Sangha of Bhikkhus, such is this assembly. Such an assembly that a small gift given to it becomes great, and a great gift greater. Such is this Sangha of Bhikkhus, such is this assembly. Such an assembly is as rare for the world to see, such is this Sangha of Bhikkhus, such is this assembly, such an assembly as would be worth journeying many leagues with a travel bag to see, such as this Sangha of Bhikkhus, such as this assembly. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus there are Bhikkhus who are arahants, with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Such Bhikkhus there are in this Sangha of Bhikkhus. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus there are Bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the five lower fetters, are due to reappear spontaneously in the purer abode, so that's an anagami, and there attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world, such bhikkhus there are in this sangha of bhikkhus. In this sangha of bhikkhus there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the three fetters and with the attenuation of lust, hatred and delusion, are once returners, returning once to this world to make an end of suffering, such bhikkhus there are in this sangha of bhikkhus. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus there are Bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the three fetters, are stream-enterers, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment, such Bhikkhus there are in this Sangha of Bhikkhus. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus there are Bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of the four foundations of mindfulness, such Bhikkhus are there in this Sangha of Bhikkhus. In this Sangha of Bhikkhus there are Bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of the four right kinds of striving, to the four bases for spiritual power, the five faculties of power and the seven enlightenment factors, the noble eightfold path, such bhikkhus there are in this sangha. In this sangha, bhikkhus are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy and equanimity, on the meditation of loathsomeness, of the perception of impermanence, such bhikkhus there are in the sangha of bhikkhus, in the sangha of bhikkhus are bhikkhus who abide devoted to the development of mindfulness of breathing. So the Buddha starts to teach the instructions. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. When the four foundations of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they fulfill the seven fact enlightenment factors. When the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. And how bhikkhus is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and benefit. So I'm not going to read the entire sutta, that's a, a different talk, but isn't that a beautiful introduction? Mm -hmm. The Buddha is content with this Sangha, which consists only of heartwood. So it's probably one of those occasions where the, the least developed person was a Sotapanna, like at the final passing away. And uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? He could obviously see that it was right time and that by staying here with all of those great disciples, monks would have been wandering in from places like Vaisali and making the journey from uh, Jitavana and those kind of places and training in this, these two monasteries and these two patrons and then the whole... You imagine, just Wisaka has 500 Sotapanna 
or a large number of Sotapanna uh, maidservants and whatnot. So the, this city, which was abundant, it was one of the superpowers of the day, and the king was uh, extremely supportive. A large percentage, as Ajahn Anand said about Rajitya, that 20% were probably Sotapanna's of the laity. So I, it may have even been more here because the Buddha taught so much here. And Jetavana did have large halls, which Anathapini was a very generous building. It had large halls for the, for the Buddha to teach uh, and to receive the guests and to teach the laity of different kings, merchants, and the workers, servants. And he taught whoever came to see him, and Ananda was the one who was liaising and uh, telling people the right time to come. And then over here, I think it was 500 rooms the Visakha had built. 500 is a, a phrase in Pali which means somewhere between three and 700. But anyway, it means a, a large a large amount. So this was uh, just like the Velavana area. This was uh, another epicenter for that uh, incredible wave of Dharma realizations. And it must have been extraordinary because every other household would have had Sotapanas. Every forest would have had Arahants. It just would have been awesome. It was about 2,500, 2,600 years ago. And so there's not that much of it left now. I'm sure our hunts do pass through occasionally with their, uh, with their <coughs> disciples coming from places like Thailand. I know they do, in fact, but there's not the same numbers. <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it, that even with the guards that want you to give them some money and the monks that want you to give some money and the monkeys and the dogs and the, in- and the Indian tourists, that you can still, you can feel something of it, can't you? And the mind does become peaceful easily, more easily. So uh, I'm glad we all came, and I'm glad I got, this is my third trip to Jehovah. I, I was able to spend ten days here about three years ago, and it was uh, the beginning of the wet season, and I was thinking of spending the wet season, but it was so hot, it was 36 degrees when it was raining. <laughs> and I've never experienced hot That's rain hot. before. <laughs> Even the rain is warm. Mm. I remember walking to the Jeta when in the rain, now I'm going to go twice a day, rain, hail, or shine. So I'm thinking, oh, it's raining, it won't be too hot. And they're sweating in the rain and feeling this warm, <laughs> warm water. So anyway, I was very happy to spend the 10 days, and then I decided to go back to Thailand. <laughs> also, when you're the only... Caucasian person, and when you when you're one of the only tourists, it's uh, you're the focus of this. Every beggar, every kid, every dog, every monkey. <laughs> no. Ajahn Amaro did spend uh, three months here. He stayed in the Korean temple. He had he, yeah, he had a good time. He must be tougher than me. Any comments about your experience today, or any comments or questions about what we've been reading? <coughs> That's in the Great Disciples of the Buddha book. That's the, um, that was written by three people, wasn't it? Bhikkhu Bodhi, Helmut Hecke, and his nana Ponikrina. Yeah. It's in that one collection, yeah. Great Disciples yeah. of the Buddha. Yeah. So yeah. Each and one of them is written by someone. So. Yeah, and it's in that, that Wisdom publication. Yeah. There's some great stories in there. Yeah. Amber Pali, she's interesting. Amber Pali is very interesting. Because she's a... She became Sotapanna also, isn't it? Nepa Sotapanna. Amber Pali. Before dying. Just before dying, yeah. She was incredibly beautiful, but she was so beautiful. And this is the important thing, as I always say to you, when you offer your flowers and you offer your fragrances, that you make the aspiration to realize the deathless. Because in Thailand, a lot of people offer flowers and they make the aspiration to have a blemishless complexion. (laughs) Because it's believed believed that if you offer flowers, that you can have beautiful skin. Now, being too beautiful is a problem. And, and people forget that. It's not the middle way. We have to aspire to the middle way. Because she was so beautiful that <coughs> princes would argue, were arguing about who would be able to marry her. And they couldn't agree, so they, they made her a courtesan so that they could have turns. Mm-hmm. And so 
the reason but she was when she offered her mangrove grove to the Buddha the Buddha accepted and so it's very interesting that there's, there's this basically high class prostitute and apparently in those days it was it was uh, if you were of that caliber it was it had a certain dignity she was of you know of high regard the wealthiest merchants and princes would have an opportunity to spend an evening with her and they and these high-level courtesans could dance and could sing and could massage and all those things. They were entertainers and extremely cultured, but um, courtesans nonetheless. But her path to enlightenment is very interesting because she was apparently a nun or a monk half her life and a prostitute the other half. So that you have this... And that the cause for her beauty was those lives of virtue and meditation the merit of that she was born very beautiful but the karmic imprints of having been promiscuous for many lives so there she was with bright spiritual faculties very very beautiful but this heavy karma of uh, around sexuality so um, but she, the Buddha did accept the mango growth and uh, she did attain the level of enlightenment the Lichavis were very upset when he when she the Buddha accepted her invitation instead of theirs but she made the invitation first but he, he could obviously see her potential I love that about the suttas and these stories is that you see the Buddha's perspective and his lack of uh, his impartiality and he will train those who can be trained and he can see who can be trained and that would be from any caste or any profession 